Uh, our third presenter is an uh, independent researcher, Vincent Weiss uh, from uh, the USA. And the presentation is on Maryland's body in Bragdon Wood, how Lewis understood both the mystical and the divine as natural. How are you doing? I'm, I have a presentation to share as well. Good. All right. So the magical and divine have for many years been depicted differently by various authors in their works. For some, this mystical element of the universe is something completely unnatural or even man-made. And for others, it is mysterious and wholly natural as is depicted in fairy tales. These concepts are found throughout literature, from Homer's Iliad to Dante's Divine Comedy to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and even up to Sanderson's Stormlight Archive. In some ways, stories are the struggle to understand the magical and the divine. This is where C.S. Lewis's personal quote-unquote struggle with the concepts of the magical and the divine appears in the third of his cosmic trilogy, The Hideous Strength. The Cosmic Trilogy um, is one of C.S. Lewis's earlier works, the first book published in 1938 and the final in 1945. The first two books follow the adventures of an academic named Ellen Ransom, who gets caught up in space travel and a cosmic struggle. The series diverges from the first two books, which took place on Mars and Venus, to the third book, which takes place on Earth. What ties it to the other two stories is the threads of religion that Lewis, Lewis sows throughout this tale. In this third and final tale, it follows the lives of Jane and Mark Stoddick, a married couple who get caught up in the final struggle of the Eldila Angelic War. This third book looks much more like a fairy tale than its... Um, science fiction story compared to the first two in the series and ends with the coming together of biblical revelation and Arthurian legend. Is in this, the story of biblical revelation and Arthurian legend, where Lewis's explanations of the works of the magical and the divine are very present. That hideous strength takes place primarily in the small college town of Edgestow, where Brechton College is located. This little college is the epicenter that the action of the story revolves around. Very early in the story, Lewis gives his opinion of nature here, writing, Though I, Lewis, am Oxford bred and very fond of Cambridge, I think that Edgestow is more beautiful than either. For one thing, it is so small. No maker of cars or sausages or marmalades has yet come to industrialize the country town, which is the setting of the university. End quote. It is already obvious here that Lewis is juxtaposing a world dominated by technology and a world dominated by nature directly from the beginning. Three elements of the story become very apparent as you're reading. The NICE at Belbury, the community at St. Anne's, and the magical world, including Merlin. Combining all these elements, we can better understand Lewis's view of the natural, starting with his depiction of the scientific community and juxtaposing that with his depiction of the religious life and the wildlife of Merlin. We begin to understand more deeply the Lewisian view of the magical and the divine as he writes in the book, quote, all this is within the natural order, end quote. Lewis presents the antithesis to what is naturally prime, natural primarily in the story of Mark and his time spent with the NICE, the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments. It's here in the NICE that the reader can better understand Lewis's opinion of scientism and the obsession with conquering the natural world for the human imagination. This is even more displayed in the use of the murdering scientist Alcazan's head, which is kept alive by unnatural machinery. Considering Lewis's opinion of technology, quote, makers of cars and sausages, end quote, as he calls it, we understand why he makes the villain of the story, the NICE. It is at this institute that Mark Studdock's character comes in contact mostly with this anti-naturalist worldview of the scientists in the story. Lewis is using Mark Studdock's story to juxtapose against the world of that of Jane Studdock is experiencing at the St. Anne's. It's here at the NICE that we first meet a group of scientists and individuals that in his essay, Ed Chapman writes, 
quote, not only is the Edwardian headquarters, the NSE depicted by images of sterility, but the figure, but the central figures of the Institute are portrayed in images of sterility, end quote. Chapman continues describing various members of the society, each of whom has hyperbolic characteristics of sterility. Wither and Frost at the top are aging administrators who shield themselves from common humanity by institutional power and bureaucratic procedures. Miss Hardcastle, the chief of security, is a sadomasochistic lesbian. Strake, an apostate preacher, looks for a god and man transformed by his technology to replace the religion Strake has betrayed and abandoned, end quote. Chapman also includes Philostrato as the ultimate version of the NICE's anti-naturalism, whereas Lewis depicts the man as being completely obsessed with how clean and lifeless the moon is. Considering Lewis's early 20th century Anglicanism, all these things are considerably anti-natural, both in opinion and action. This comes to a culmination in the head of Alcazan, renowned murdering French scientist, who is at the beginning of the story beheaded by guillotine. This head of Alcazan not only symbolically exists as the head of the NICE, but also a literal disembodied head brought back to life by machinery, the most unnatural of things. As Philostrato says most proudly, quote, our head is the first of the new men, the first that lives beyond animal life. As far as nature is concerned, he is already dead. If nature had her way, his brain would now be moldering in the grave, end quote. Philostrato's words here are stark, showing the whole attitude of the Institute. He, in a lot of ways, could function as the NICE's spokesman, and for us as a reader, he does. Lewis has another book that focuses on similar topics to that hideous strength. In a lot of ways, this book is a companion piece to the entirety of the Cosmic Trilogy. It is titled The Abolition of Man and is C.S. Lewis's treatise against subjective philosophy and progressivism, where that hideous strength narratively shows the readers a world where state-sanctioned scientists come in and utilize scientific instrumentation to manifest their power in the world. The abolition of man directly defines Lewis's view on the subject. This becomes very apparent in the third section of The Abolition of Man, which holds the same title as the book, where Lewis discusses the idea of man conquering nature. He writes that people speak on the idea that man is winning against nature as if it were at war with it. But he points out that in reality, quote, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument, end quote. If you're considering the story of the NICE in, in that hideous strength, then you can recognize this very worldview being present throughout the entirety of the organization. Most importantly, it is the very concept of the conquest of nature that is present in Philostrato's explanation of the head and is very apparent in the appearance and activity of Alcazan's head at the NICE. Instead of the head of Alcazan being a human conquest over nature, we quickly realize in the story that in actuality, the head is being used by some other power a human body being conquered by something else. In the story, these powers are called macrobes, the evil Eldila or the dark Eldila. They are the cosmic trilogy equivalent to a fallen angel. They function similarly to a demon possessing a body. Leaving us with Lewis's honest opinion on the trajectory of such anti-natural use of, of technology, something echoed in the abolition of man. Quote, I am only making clear what man's conquest of nature really means, and especially that final stage in the conquest, which perhaps is not so far off. The final stage is come when man, by eugenics, by prenatal conditioning, and by an education and propaganda based on a perfect applied psychology, has obtained full control over himself. Human nature will be the last part of nature to surrender to man. The battle will then be won. We shall have taken the thread out of the hand of Clotho and henceforth be free to make our species whatever we wish to, it to be. The battle will indeed be won, but who precisely will have won it? End quote. The NICE is, of course, juxtaposed by, juxtaposed by another organization of a sort, the community of people at St. Anne's that Jane Suddick joins in the story. While Belbury, the headquarters of the NICE, is described as a, quote, florid Edwardian mansion, 
At the sides, it seemed to have sprouted into a wide, a widespread outgrowth of new cement buildings, which housed the blood transfusion office, end quote. St. Anne's on the Hill is depicted as, quote, a very large garden. It was like the garden in Peter Rabbit, like the garden in the Romance of the Rose, or like the garden on the top of some Mesopotamian ziggurat, which had probably given rise to the whole legend of paradise, end quote. Lewis immediately evokes images of paradise here in the first description of St. Anne's in the ancient world, especially in the Near East, places like Mesopotamia and Egypt, walled gardens were seen as a places of paradise in both representation and actuality. Additionally, Lewis is, is intentionally layering the image of a garden here to be like that of the Garden of Eden found in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. As Maureen Carroll points out in her book on gardens in the ancient world, quote, earthly gardens in both the Christian and Islamic faith were often perceived as reflections of paradise. The Byzantine Emperor's Palace Garden clearly equated this with heavenly paradise, as we can see in John Geometri's description of the Eretype Palace near Constantinople in the second half of the 10th century AD, end quote. Further images of Eden are present here as well, with the appearance of Ransom, the head of the organization, an obvious opposite of the head of the NICE. This man is a full man, beautiful, appearing as a boy of 20 and an aged man beard like King Arthur and hair golden in a voice that, quote, seemed like sunlight and gold, end quote. Immediate connections can be drawn by the reader to Christ in the Transfiguration story, or even a pre-fallen a pre -fallen Adam. Ransom is seemingly a perfected human being, or one on his way to a sort of perfection. In his words, wounds, he is quite Christ-like, but in his actions, he is likened to a representative figure of mankind, of living of living or representation of living as well in the story. Unlike Alcazan's head, rotting in death and dominated by, demo by demonic forces, you see Ransom's life radiating in almost near perfection before Jane to such a degree that she is rendered awestruck by his very presence. He is a living thing, acting on his own will, not dominated by demonic forces, but participating with the Aldila, the angelic powers. His headship of the St. Anne's group is not something domination, like the head of the NICE, but instead it is a headship of sacrifice, that is most noticed in the, his wounded foot, a Christ-like wound. These elements of paradise and um, in the representation of Ransom as this Christ-like, Adam-like head of the household should put into perspective for the reader what Lewis, a Christian author, might consider natural. The animals of St. Anne's ought to evoke further to the reader images of Eden, as Nancy Lou Patterson describes in her article on the community at St. Anne's. Quote, pinch the cat, Baron Corvo the jackdaw, an assembly of unnamed mice, and my favorite, the bear, Mr. Baltitude. Lewis is using the animals to demonstrate several ideas. The hierarchy encourages rather than prevents collaboration, companionship, that humankind raises animals, but means domestication to a new level of being. And what at the animal level, the ancient unities proposed by Owen Barfield function completely just as they did in human consciousness in the earliest periods of development, end quote. Magic is the final element that make itself apparent in the story, sort of third participant in the war between the Eldila and the Macrobes. Magic is like the divine in, sense, in the sense that it is the profoundly otherworldly experience outside of what m the modernist man might expect. It is unlike the divine in the sense that it finds its origin something more worldly, more pagan, like the NICE with its head and the community at St. Anne's with the head of ran the head, its headship and ransom, the Pendragon, Magic, in its way, functions as an organization, the story, and has its headship, its representation, and the person of Merlin. It's important to note that magic, unlike science and religion, is subtle, is a subtle element of the story. For the majority of the story, Merlin is functionally a neutral character, presenting the reader with the tension of the NIC and St. Anne's competing to get Merlin on their side. There was no doubt in his mind now that the enemy had but this is a quote. Uh, there is no doubt in his mind now. The enemy had bought Bragdon Wood to find Merlin. And if they had found him, they would reawake him. The old druid would inevitably cast in his lot with the new planners. What could prevent his doing so? End quote. As the story points out, there are two 
different ways that magic can be viewed. One being Renaissance magic, the other more older, more pagan, natural magic. One, the one that modern people view as magic usually is a thing of the Renaissance, as Lewis points out. Quote, the whole Renaissance outburst of forbidden arts had its had it seemed been a method of losing one's soul on singularly unfavorable terms. This version of what people call magic seems to be more artificial and seemingly anti-religious in its activity. Lewis uses, for example, characters from Renaissance stories, Faustus the Necromancer, Prospero from, Tempt from the Tempest, and Archimago from the Fairy Queen. All of these figures are using powers of spirits outside of themselves in the story. And considering Lewis's Christianity, this is probably to be understood by the characters in the book as demonic. This is brought up against Merlin's character in which Lewis points out that instead of the power of magic coming from some demonic spirit, quote, the older art had been a different proposition and that instead a figure like Merlin who seems to produce his results simply by being Merlin. Magic in the story seems to be something wholly unapparent to the characters. For example, you have Jane's latent seer abilities, which present the reader with the fairy tale aspects of the book. But Jane seems to think that they're nightmares or a condition, something to be cured. When it does become apparent in the story, there's a general anxiety around the magic by both groups. The St. Anne's group fears it for what damages it might bring to their cause, and the NICE sees it as a means of conquest. They are scrambling to get their hands on, which, as is being proposed, magic is part of nature. Then it makes sense why the NICE is treating Merlin in the way they do. Merlin's character is probably the oddest part of this book. If you have followed the story of the Eldila and the Macrobes from the previous two books in the trilogy, then you should be well aware of the angelic activity already pre present in this science in these science fiction books. Merlin, on the other hand, blatantly shows Lewis's hand, so to speak, with the fairy tale. The imagery surrounding Merlin is stark, considering the natural subjects of his character throughout the book. His body is interred in Bragdon Wood, a fascinating location um, for a long dead wizard and advisor to such a great a king as Arthur. Lewis's character, the narrator, describes his visit to Bracton College and the descent into Bracton Wood, where he lay beside the well and thought on its immense history. The description is rife with natural imagery, describing an enclosed forest, which, considering St. Anne's and the medieval understanding of a walled garden, should evoke symbolism of the true natural order. Further, he describes the, rem the remoteness of this place, where the sounds of the road are unheard, hearkening back to his earlier quip on industry, and again symbolizing this place as a protected spot from the modernizing elements of the outside world. In the book, Merlin even asks, quote, give me but seven days to go in and out and up and down and to and fro to renew old acquaintance. These fields and I, this wood and I, have much to say to one another, giving the reader an obvious connection between the character and nature. As pointed out above, the NICE views nature as something to be conquered. And in their takeover of Bracton College, they begin to demolish Bragdon Wood and destroy Bragdon Well, too. They're attempting to conquer the part of nature that is magic. And the way they go about it is the same as they, as a representation of industrial, industrialized society, have gone about conquering other parts of nature. It is no wonder that in the end we see Ransom as the Pendragon, the heir to King Arthur, and his community at St. Anne's, a seemingly monastic group, form a natural alliance with Merlin to fight against the forces of those who are attempting to overtake nature and conquer reality. The imagery of natural order fighting against the tyranny of men attempting to overthrow it has its finality in that final action of the book. We see Merlin leading an assault on the NICE by leading a pack of animals into the headquarters and destroying the people and the place, with its cl climax at the destruction of Alcazan's head by the bear Mr. Bultitude's bite. The imagery of the divine in the walled garden and the magic in Merlin come together to defeat the demonic in Alcazan. This can be one of the ways to understand the story of the hideous strength, the story of the cosmic trilogy, or even one could argue that is how Lewis and probably most Christians view the story of the real world. Men in this book, 
the scientists, and demons, in this book, the macrobes, attempt to break natural order so they can make for themselves whatever they would like out of reality. For example, the Christian story of Lucifer and his rebellion depicted in the book of Revelation and expanded upon in literature such as Milton's Paradise Lost a demon unwilling to follow God's plan. In the Bible, which holds countless tales depicting humanity attempting to subvert God's plan, begins with Adam and Eve given a commandment and ultimately breaking it by subverting natural order. All of this and so much more is apparent in this book, The the Hideous Strength, condensed in such a way for the reader to understand what is happening. The book synthesizes all this together by depicting these groups of the anti-natural and the groups of the natural coming to a head in some kind of a cosmic war. In the end, it is nature that wins, with animals destroying the NICE and the new body for the dark Eldila. It is obvious, though, that Lewis is making a point that our modern world is confused about nature, too, so we understand more deeply what Lewis is writing about. With all of this in mind, we can better understand what Lewis means when he writes, quote, Merlin is the reverse of Belberry. He's at the opposite extreme. He is the last vestige of an old order in which matter and spirits were, from our modern point of view, confused. For him, every operation on nature is a kind of personal contact, like coaxing a child or stroking one's horse. After him came the modern man to whom nature is something dead, a machine to be worked and taken to bits if it won't work the way he pleases. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, I I have one. Um, hi, Vince. It's actually exciting to see Vince here. Vince and I were old undergraduate mates, so that's exciting. Uh, I'm curious about this idea of the garden um, and how it relates to the sort of severed head. It seems like there there is artifice in a garden. It's a planned space, right? Um, but that is an example of some kind of synergy between human ends and also the ends of other creatures. Um, whereas the head of Philostrata, or, uh, or, or who is it, Alcazan, um, seems to be something sort of purely abstracted from material um, ends and any end other than human at all, right? And therefore becomes subject to this disembodied and therefore kind of demonic force. Is is that right? Do you want to speak a little more about that? Yeah, yeah, no, I was I was on, like my original study in this, this paper was from Merlin, but then I, I quickly got way more interested in the garden act- aspect, actually, I was, I was reading more for it. Um, I think you make a really good point that like there's there's this like um kind of like two ideas of human participation with nature like one's a domination of nature we see with Alcazan's head which like they they literally pump air into it to make it live again which it's not actually living it's, it's possessed by this this spirit thing um, but the at, at Saint Anne's we see a garden which you know is human participation still in that where it's but there are these animals living among them. Mr. Baltitude is a bear, which, you know, none of us want to go stand next to a bear. This bear is like living inside the house with them. So it, there's this, there's a different type of participation. It's not like this conquering of nature. It's just living together with nature that's taking place there, um, which I think um, if you read, if I mean, I, I would like to read more on this subject. There's something I'm very interested in now that I've read some on it. Uh, Maureen Carroll's book's fantastic, by the way. Um, it, the ancient view of gardens is super cool. Um, it they have this, the gardens at the top of mountains are like what they consider to be heaven. That's what we you know. The Garden of Eden is throwing that same concept as well. So, thank you. Um, I also have a comment or like an observation that. Uh, I'm mostly focused on Tolkien, but I'm starting to delve into uh, C.S. Lewis as well. 
And uh, what you were talking about, the two two different kinds of magic, like one is a more holy magic, the other one is more uh, darker or sinister, which wants to disrupt the natural order of the world. Uh, this is something which I see also in Tolkien's work. And he mentioned that he uses the word magic because English language doesn't have a better term for, to describe what he, he has in mind. And... Uh, yeah, also in uh, the Narnia stories, we have the, the lion Aslan representing the good kind of holy magic. And uh, then the, the witch uh, uh, who instills the eternal winter on the world, so disrupts the, the natural order as well. And she represents the, the evil magic. Yeah, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to comment that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, I probably had, would have had more on this in there if I had space in the paper. But uh, one thing um, I was fascinated with, like I didn't even pick this up my like first time when I read this book, um, was the talk on um, Prospero and uh, Faustus and um, Archimago or Archimago, who um, are all like Renaissance depictions of magicians, right? And all three of them are like working with demons. Like all three of them have the spirit that gives them power. Um, and then like 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 Merlin or Gandalf, right? And this book, Merlin, this book, and Gandalf and Tolkien's literature, or even his like good magicians in his literature, they're all just casting, they're just doing magic. They're just doing like the, the acts of like nature in a lot of ways, um, very differently than like conjuring a spirit to like get power. So. Also, uh, in Tolkien's work, uh, the, the good kind of magic is mostly represented by the elves who live in very close connection with the nature. They uh, they are described that they listen to trees, they learned, uh, they learned the, the tree's language, they taught the trees to talk, the human language, and so on. Uh, and on the other hand, we have uh, the wizard like Saruman and uh, Sauron and Melkor, who all, from the beginning they revolt against the natural order they just destroy the country and uh, they are trying to gain some kind of forbidden knowledge for them and uh, that's uh, where their evil re results from or stems from i too i too love tolkien so i i completely concur <laughs> okay do we have any more questions Okay, um, so thank you very much for the lovely presentation. And... Uh...